Welcome brave souls to Fear File Chronicles, your one-way ticket to spine-chilling stories and terrifying tales. Tonight, we'll be diving into the darkest corners of the human mind with the story, The Night My Grandfather Returned, penned by the twisted mind of you Swedish creep. Together, we'll explore the unexplained and face our deepest fears. But before we begin, if you enjoy trembling in terror, be sure to hit that like button, share this video with your fellow fear fanatics, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click the bell notification so you never miss an eerie episode. Your support truly means the world to us, so feel free to leave a comment below to join the Fear File Chronicles community. Now, without further ado, let's unravel the mysteries of the unknown together as we delve into tonight's fear-inducing story, the night my grandfather returned. Dim the lights and prepare yourself for a chilling journey into the Fear File Chronicles. Up until the day she passed away, my grandmother lived in a small cabin deep within the woods of Maine, just outside of the tiny town of Beaver Cove. My grandfather built that house with his own two hands back in the 1960s. While it didn't look like much, they still managed to raise three kids there, of which one was my father. When the events I am about to disclose to you took place, roughly two months had passed since my grandfather, Henry, had died of prostate cancer. Since my grandmother was quite old, my father and his siblings tried to convince her to put up the cabin for sale, but she refused. In her own words, Every wall, nook, and cranny of my home is a symbol of my sweet Henry's love and hard work. So yeah, I get where she's coming from. Besides, the scenery surrounding the cabin was breathtaking. Up until recently, I got nothing but fond memories of spending summers, celebrating birthdays and Christmases at my grandparents' place. However, something happened a while back that changed all that. When I started studying at St. Joseph's College in Maine, I moved all the way from Bangor to Standish. While I was thrilled to have been accepted, my grandmother was noticeably upset as the physical distance grew between us. For a while, we would talk on the phone at least once per week, but as time passed, the calls became fewer and shorter. I tried to introduce her to Skype, but soon gave up as my grandmother was too much of a technophone. Whenever we got the chance to talk, she would always ask me when I would come and visit her. It might sound callous, but I did find it annoying. Don't take me wrong. I loved my grandmother, but I just couldn't drop everything I had and leave just because she missed me. However, I do feel bad, as she must have felt lonely with grandfather having passed away and both my parents working hard. Eventually, the guilt got to me, which ended up with me buying a train ticket. My father had agreed to pick me up in Bangor, as there was no direct train connection to Beaver Cove. The trip was uneventful, and I spent most of it sleeping before the conductor's voice boomed through the sound system, notifying me and my fellow passengers that we had reached Bangor Station. The skies were gray, and it rained lightly when I met up with my dad at the platform. We greeted each other with a hug, after which he suggested that we grabbed a coffee at a local coffee shop. We managed to find a table for ourselves in the back, once we've placed our orders, far away from eager ears. Once I've informed the old man about my studies and how the trip went, the topic changed to that of my grandmother. So, how is she doing? I asked while sipping on my chamomile tea. My dad looked up, brushing his peppermint beard clean from pastry crumbs before he spoke. She's fine, I suppose. Although I have to admit she's been acting a bit strange as of late. His brow furrowed. It was obvious that he was worried. I don't like to think about it, but I reckon it might be early onset dementia. Regardless, a woman her age shouldn't live like that, all cooped up deep in those woods. It was one thing when, well, when Grandpa was still with us, but I don't like that she's all alone out there. He then leaned back with a deep sigh. He looked tired, tired and time-worn. Grandma wasn't alone in mourning Grandpa. We all did, especially my father. They had always been close, even hunted together, up until Grandpa was too weak to carry his rifle. But this talk of dementia was news to me. How could he be so sure, and this talk about her acting strange? What was that about? 
What do you mean she's been acting strange? I finally asked. Before I proceed, I need to state something. Grandmother has always been a role model, both for me and my younger sister, Kathy, an astute and compassionate woman. That being said, she was also very determined. Last time we had spoke on the phone, I hadn't noticed anything odd or out of the ordinary. If she actually had dementia, then I would have noticed, since my grandfather actually started showing signs of that awful disease in his 70s. But regardless of that, his wife never left his side. As I sat there thinking, listening to my dad going on about the way she acted, I started to grow contemptuous. The loss of a loved one is bound to have a great impact on one's psyche. So, was it really that surprising if she was out of it or acted in a way not in line with her normal behavior? I cleared my throat, took yet another sip of tea, and studied my dad. He emptied his coffee and put down his cup. He then remained silent, nervously running his fingers through his thick beard until he spoke again. I suppose the thing that worries me the most is that she as of late claims that she's been in touch with your grandfather. It, it isn't normal. I, I interrupted him. You remember when Jenny's grandfather died? Her grandmother would claim that she talked with her husband for months after his passing. The way I see it, it's a way to come to terms with grief, to overcome tragedy and cherish what once was. Jenny was an old childhood friend of mine, and our families used to be quite close back in the day. My dad knew very well that Cynthia, Jenny's grandmother, was a clear-headed woman, even at the generous age of 95. But alas, my dad is the way he is, skeptical and stubborn. Not a bad person by any means, but very opinionated and not keen to embrace anything that he deems as too unconventional. I just wanted to assure him that even if grandma was mourning, that she was fine and that her talks with grandpa had a therapeutic purpose. One way or another, everything would be fine. But I didn't say that. My previous attempts at having deeper conversations with my father had sadly never amounted to much. So I just let it go. We spent five more minutes at that cafe before we paid the bill and headed out. 20 minutes later, we rolled up and parked on my parents' driveway. It was cloudy with no precipitation. At some point, I'd say five minutes into the drive, I dozed off listening to my father talking about how much the countryside had changed since my move. It really hadn't, at least not judging from what I make out from my foggy vision. As soon as I got out of the car, I rubbed the fatigue from my eyes. Our house had been repainted, yellow instead of red. The roofing tiles were new, and the lawn was freshly cut. I was very happy to see that the woods behind our house was still standing, and as I admired it, Old childhood memories came knocking on my door. Exploring the wildlife, roasting marshmallows, and afterwards, telling creepy ghost stories around the campfire. I smiled, happy to be back. Mom greeted me as soon as I walked in, hugged me close, and told me how much she had missed me. After carrying in my luggage, I helped out with dinner. Finally, something other than takeout and noodles. It was while eating that I found out that mom had talked with my grandmother and that I could borrow their car. Personally, I wouldn't have minded taking it easy, catch up with my parents and pay a visit to my grandma the next day, but I could sense the urgency in my mother's voice. So roughly around 3 p.m., I left Bangor for Beaver Cove. The trip took about two hours, as my grandmother lived outside of Beaver Cove, a town that I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with. It's small. And by that, I mean really small, with a population barely exceeding 100 people. I'm not going to bore you with history lessons, but if I remember correctly, there's been people living in the area around Moosehead Lake as far back as the 1920s. Even in the dim light of the sun crawling down behind the treetops, the scenery was breathtaking with its tapestry of orange and red. Soon after passing through Beaver Cove, I took a turn and soon found myself on a narrow, winding dirt road. At this point, the sun had almost disappeared completely behind the forested hills. Even with the headlights on, the darkened wilderness had taken on more of a menacing appearance, and I was unsure whether or not I was lost. Thankfully, after a short while, I started to notice the first signs of life in the shape of summer houses breaking through the thicket. It was currently slow season, and apart from three of the cabins, all the lights were out. 
During the summers, the area would be teeming with life, mostly vacationing families and outdoor enthusiasts. Now, the area felt deserted and hollow, bringing to mind one of almost 4,000 ghost towns spread across the country. My journey directed me to an even more remote dirt road and eventually ended at the top of a small hill surrounded by thick, coniferous trees. In the impervious autumnal blackness, I could make out the glowing outline of my grandma's kitchen window. As soon as I parked the car, her crooked shape appeared on the other side, and as soon as she saw me, the old woman waved eagerly. Outside, it was damp and chilly. Inside, however, the temperature was far more pleasant. The old wood-burning stove was lit, filling the small abode with a welcoming warmth. As always, Grandma had brewed coffee, and even though she had arthritis, she had also baked brownies. I voiced my concern that I could have brought something with me, but she wouldn't have it. What can I say? Old people are stubborn. As we exchanged pleasantries, I observed the small woman in front of me. She was as dapper as ever, newly permed hair and wearing one of her favorite flowery dresses. That quick wit and dry humor was still there. All in all, very little had changed, regardless of her old age. It made me question the words of my father. How could this elegant, vivacious, elderly woman possibly be plagued by something as horrible as dementia? I saw no reason for his worries. If his mother actually did communicate with her deceased husband, then it was probably for the better. After all, the ways that we mourn are many, depending on who we are as people. I glanced at my phone and realized that it was getting quite late. Better round things off. I was about to drink up the last of my coffee when she locked eyes with me and smiled. Grandpa should be arriving soon. Why don't you stay so you can meet him? My lips felt cold against the brim of the cup. Her words had taken me by surprise. Her smile was in no way eerie or intimidating, and yet it creeped me out. I carefully put down my cup without breaking eye contact, the words of my father echoing in my head. Had he been right all along? There had been times where she had told some rather macabre and surprisingly dark jokes, but I wasn't sure what to make of this. I tried to reason with myself, and in the process remembered something my mother, who actually had worked with people who had dementia, once had told me. In her own words, whenever you deal with someone who displays dementia behavior, do not judge, acknowledge, and let them know that their feelings are legitimate. A sinking feeling came over me. The perfect image of my sweet grandmother, so perceptive and wise, was now at stake. But I was willing to do anything for her. So, with some hesitation, I eventually replied, Oh, really? Is he always on time? She nodded slowly, and as she did so, her smile grew wider. Every time. My sweet Henry is always punctual. She looked out the kitchen window. Oh my, looks like it's going to start raining. Why don't you stay over? Wouldn't want you to drive home in this kind of weather. The roads can be quite treacherous, you know? You can use the guest room. I cleaned it this morning. I hesitated. Although I knew it was probably for the best to play long, something felt wrong. For the first time ever, I felt afraid being at my grandparents' place. That said, I didn't want to turn her down. Um, sure. I just need to message mom and dad first. I picked up my phone and while writing, I told a half-truth to my grandmother that I needed to leave early the next day. Her smile beamed as she clapped her hands together. Wonderful. Henry is going to be so happy. Grandma's facial expression hadn't changed ever since she first mentioned her husband. Even as she emptied her coffee, those bright blue eyes burrowed deep into my very being. Still, I got the feeling she hadn't noticed my discomfort. She was more cheerful than ever, which in and of itself wasn't a negative thing. But not long ago, she was devastated. When she addressed how happy Grandpa would be to see me again, it all felt like a dream, as if he in fact was still alive and would come home any minute. Sadly, that was a lie. I was there the day they buried him. I saw the coffin being lowered into the grave, felt the tears burning my eyes as my father bid him farewell. I studied her carefully. She kept smiling vacantly. It was, sadly, apparent that something was off. 
A part of me wanted to wake her up from her fantasies, but I couldn't. For the first time in forever, my grandmother seemed happy, and whether or not it was all just in her head, well, who was I to deny her that? While waiting, we looked through old photo albums. I'd leafed through them countless times. I didn't mind it. In fact, I really appreciated it. Only this time, my mind was occupied with thoughts about Grandma's grasp on reality. For my own sanity's sake, I eventually started downplaying the situation, trying to find new perspectives. After all, maybe it was all some sort of ritual that she practiced in order for her to fall asleep. That idea made me somewhat calmer, which ultimately pushed away my anxiety, and instead made me curious regarding exactly how she communicated with my grandfather. So, I ended up asking her. My grandmother blushed and let out a snicker. He usually knocks on the walls. Could it be the house settling? I thought to myself. All things considered, the cabin was built roughly 60 years ago. Grandfather was a good carpenter, but no amount of blood, sweat, and tears can withstand the inevitable effects of time. I knew that, especially during weather conditions such as these, that the branches of close-by trees sometimes would brush against the walls of the house. And let's not forget, my grandmother was old, and therefore her hearing wasn't what it used to be. Case closed, or so I thought, as what she said next cut my respite short. He's asking me to come outside. That silly goose. My little Henry, has he forgotten that the cold makes my knees ache? I was speechless. She then continued to tell me how Grandpa usually walked around the cabin, and in between the knocking, he'd tell her to come join him. Apparently, this went on for a good few minutes before he would depart. She spoke of this as if it was something cute, an innocent game between two lovers. As I listened to her talking about these nightly visits, I started to feel scared. Time and time again, I had to swallow to keep my dry throat moist. My dad was right. She was really starting to lose it. Her old age, but above all the tragic loss of her beloved husband, had completely distorted her concept of reality. I was about to tell her to stop, but then she whispered, It won't be much longer now. Confused, I said, Um, much longer until... What? The corners of the old woman's mouth curved upward, showing all of her teeth. Until Henry arrives, of course. Always on time. 9 p.m. on the dot. Her bright blue eyes shifted to the clock on the wall. I followed suit. 8.55. Five minutes left. A pang of pity filled my heart. For as long as I could remember, she had been my role model, the very epitome of courage and strength. I can't imagine anything more horrible than witnessing someone that you've admired for so many years changing so drastically while capitulating to such a horrible disease. But what else was there for me to do than to play my part? Please, stay up with me. I can't wait for you to meet him. She was right. I really did miss him. I gritted my teeth and nodded in silence. A voice inside my head screamed at me to go back to my parents and then leave Beaver's Cove in Bangor for good. But that wasn't an option. At least, not yet. As soon as the clock struck nine, Grandma got up and then proceeded to trudge over to the living room window, where she stopped. I got up and walked up next to her. Dark and plump rain clouds blotted out any and all moonlight. Raindrops padded softly against the window pane. After a while, I discreetly glanced at the phone. Five minutes past nine. I turned my head towards Grandma. Her skinny fingers were interlaced with each other, like that of an expectant child at Christmas. Time kept ticking away, but I heard no knocking or anyone calling from outside. Then again, if I had, I would have panicked. I should have felt relief, but instead it made me even more worried about Grandma. In the bleak light of the ceiling lamp, I observed her face. Her light blue, almost white eyes were sorrowful yet distant, as if longing for something that was no longer there. I was about to reach out to her, but I quickly withdrew my hand. Why I did this, I'm not really sure. Instead, I checked the time, 9.20 p.m. Outside, the rain had started pouring down and in the far distance, a thunderstorm was approaching. The dense pine woods swayed back and forth in the wind, but no sign of my grandfather. We stayed up until 11 p.m., 
before it was decided to call it a day. Grandma was visibly sad, but tried her best to keep up appearances until she went to her room. After brushing my teeth, I lay down in the guest room bed. The rain had subsided along with the clouds. On the wall, opposite the foot of the bed, the moonlight depicted shadows of crooked pine trees. I was laying on my back, my eyes fixed on the ceiling. I couldn't stop thinking about my grandma. I felt sorry for her. The thought saddened me, but her health had undoubtedly declined due to the recent events, that being the loss of her soulmate. There was also the question of whether or not I should tell my father about what I had witnessed. Grandma had once said that she will die in her own bed, not among strangers or people that would try and wipe her ass. The mere mention of her moving into a retirement home would make her furious. My head ached the more I pondered, and eventually I decided to get up to grab a glass of water. Anything to distract myself. The lights were still out as I left the room. Quiet as a mouse, I tiptoed to the kitchen. Once there, I grabbed a glass, filled it with water, and then emptied it as silent as I could. I then put it back and proceeded to sneak back. When I was about to pass by the living room, something caught my attention that made me stop in my tracks. Apart from the wind picking up again, everything was quiet, but that wasn't it. It was a sound. Maybe a thump? The house creaking? Could have just been a branch scraping against one of the walls of the house. No, wait. There it was again. It was faint, but it was without a shadow of a doubt the same thing I had just heard. Three short knocks. I waited, anticipating the noise to resume, but it never did. I shot a look at the living room window, at the trees closest by. A fragment from my childhood suddenly resurfaced, a memory of when my family stayed the night in my grandparents' cabin. It was late at night, when I had woken up to the sound of someone knocking on one of the windows. I got so scared that I ran to the room where my parents were sleeping, crying, and telling them that someone tried to get me. My mother comforted me, reassuring me that it was just a tree branch, nothing more. I massaged my temples. That was years ago. I'm an adult now, and I should know better than to get scared by something that could be chalked up to nature just doing its thing. And with that, I went back to bed where I eventually managed to fall asleep. But it wouldn't take long before my descent into the world of dreams was disrupted. Dazed and confused, I sat up, not exactly sure what had awoken me. At this point, the glow of the moon had faded, and the shadows on the wall were now blurrier. I was about to lie down again when I noticed that the thumps from earlier had resumed. It was difficult to pinpoint exactly where they were coming from, but what I did notice was that something had changed. This time around, they were accompanied by something else. Someone was talking. I couldn't distinguish their age or gender, or what was being said, nor any specific cadence or tempo. I tried looking through the window, but couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. The things I was hearing, did they come from inside or outside? The only way to make sure was to investigate. Therefore, I turned on the flashlight on my phone and carefully pushed open the door. My phone's flashlight desperately tried to cut through the darkness, enveloping the insides of the cabin. At first, I didn't see any anomalies, but after just taking a few steps, I froze. Standing dead center in the living room, I saw someone, a figure, slightly bent, dressed in a light nightgown, white shoulder-length hair, gray slippers, grandma. I almost had a heart attack. Jesus, what was she doing? She stood there, stiff like a board with her back turned to me, eyes fixed on the window. Was she sleepwalking, talking in her sleep? Whatever the case, she wasn't saying anything right now. Every now and then, the exposed rafters in the ceiling squealed. I could also make out the familiar scratching of tree limbs, as if they were long fingers wanting to get in. I stood and watched my grandmother. Somnambulist or not, I still had to tread lightly. One false move and she might get a cardiac arrest. On light feet, I slowly approached her. I was almost within reach of her when she all of a sudden spoke. Grandpa is here. I immediately pulled back. The floor that had been warmed up by the wood-burning stove now felt cold to the touch. An unspeakable fear took hold of me. I dared not confront her, but instead looked around to make sure that we were still alone. The sounds outside, 
The gust of the wind, the creaking of trees that had stood there long before the house was built, filled my ears. But then something else bled through. Floorboards. Weight shifting. My grandmother was turning towards me. A grotesque image started taking shape in the back of my head. Grandma with an exaggerated big smile. Teeth of an animal. Eyes of a lunatic. My amygdala was on overdrive. Internally, I was drowning in an ocean of my own horror. In my mind's eye, she was turning into a monster that would eat me alive. Stephen? My eyes had been closed when she said my name. Reluctantly, I opened them, prepared to face my impending doom, but nothing happened. Nothing about her appeared horrifying. The smile she wore on her thin lips was reassuring. Her hands were clutched against her chest as if she was praying. Eventually, I found the words to speak. Grandma, what are you doing up? Without wincing, she said, Grandpa's home. As soon as my fear had wholly dissipated, anger started flaring up within. There was nothing there. As much as it pained me to admit, I had just about had it. She just kept looking at me, completely isolated in her own little bubble. However, once I'd calmed down, I put my arm around her and started leading her back to her room. As we walked, I kept looking over my shoulder, but to no surprise, I saw nothing. I sighed. Nothing but the deep, dark woods of Maine. I tucked her in, and wouldn't you know it, she fell asleep the second her head landed on the pillow. The mere thought that she sooner or later had to move away made me depressed. I'd been a fool to believe that she had started to recover, but I suppose that sooner or later, it had to happen. Who knows how many times she had been awake late at night to talk with my grandfather. It was all a fabrication, figments produced by pain and old age. I decided to take a quick walk, just around the house, and get some fresh air while clearing my head. After getting dressed, I unlocked the door and snuck out. The night sky was lit with stars. My parents' car still stood parked on the gravel patch. It was freezing, so I zipped up my jacket while observing my surroundings. The narrow dirt road disappeared into the darkness of the wilderness. I felt a bit uneasy, but started walking. Apart from my grandparents' house, all I could see was miles upon miles of woodland. Balsam fir, pine, birch, you name it. I took a deep breath. The smell of autumn, sounds of dead leaves and general stillness calmed my senses. It was then that I caught a glimpse of movement to my left, further in the trees. Based on my previous experiences that night, you might think that I would have gotten startled, but I wasn't. Must have been an animal, I thought to myself. After all, these parts had many of them ranging from shrews to moose, even bear. Judging from the sound I had heard, it didn't sound like anything as big as the latter, though. Just animals displaying animal behavior. I looked at my phone, and it was then that I got an idea. Maybe I could take a photo of it. I mean, it couldn't hurt. I managed to snap four quick photos before the animal had managed to move out of sight. Sadly, my phone's camera wasn't the best, so I couldn't really make out what it was. Oh well, it was worth a try. And with that, I went back inside and went to bed. Next day, I got up early, had breakfast, and then went back to my parents to spend the rest of my weekend there. I never ended up telling Dad about what had happened. I'm still not sure whether or not it was due to selfishness or me being a coward. On Monday, just after returning to my apartment from class, my phone started ringing. It was my mom. I answered. She sounded upset. Stephen, have you read the news? This was really out of character for her. I was taken aback. What? No. Why? She wasn't alone. I could hear that my dad was there. Wait. I'll tell Dad to send you a link so that you can read it yourself. Um, okay. Call me when you're done reading, okay? She then hung up on me. What was that all about? A moment later, my phone buzzed. It was my dad. He had sent a message containing a news article. I clicked on it and started reading. The caption was straight to the point. Older couple found murdered with big bold letters. I saw a picture of a house. A house I recognized. I had been there several times when visiting my grandparents. The elderly couple that lived there were called Blanche and Noah. Yesterday, their son Tommy had paid them a visit. He knocked, but no one came, 
so he let himself in. The door was unlocked. Tommy called out but got no reply, and after he searched through the house, he concluded that it was unoccupied. He left the house and walked out back. That's when he saw something. There, among the trees, he saw the bodies belonging to his parents. In his own words, they had been butchered like animals. As soon as law enforcement showed up, they started shaking doors and asking questions. While no one had heard any commotion, there were two households who claimed that they had heard strange noises, as if someone was knocking while begging them to come outside. A creeping feeling of unease coursed through my hands, making them shake uncontrollably. Everything that I had experienced during my visit at Grandma's came back full force. The knocks, the off-putting voice, the photos. Wait, the photos. I quickly opened my photo gallery and started scrolling until I found what I was looking for. Four more or less identical pictures of dark, dense forest. I tried using different filters, zooming in, but I had no idea how to improve their quality. Then I got an idea. I went through my contacts and eventually found the phone number to a classmate, a girl called Charlotte. She was an amateur photographer, and I knew she was good with photo editing. I pressed call and waited. After three rings, she picked up. Hi, how's... I didn't even give her the chance to ask me how I was doing. Charlotte, you gotta help me. Okay. Calm down. What's going on? No time to explain. I'm going to send you a couple of pictures. I want you to edit them, brighten them up or whatever. I need to see if there's anything there. I'll send them right now. Please try and get it done ASAP. I ended the call abruptly and proceeded to send the images. While waiting, I aimlessly meandered around in my apartment. My head ached while my heart felt like it was going to beat its way through my ribs. I started feeling dizzy and nauseated. I tried to recount what I had heard in detail, connecting the dots. 30 minutes passed, but no update. What the hell was taking so long? I was about to call Charlotte when I got an email notification. Finally, she had finally sent the pictures. I went to my inbox and opened the mail. It read as followed. Sorry, ran into some software glitches. Took longer than expected. Anyway, Here's the pictures. I gotta say, these are pretty freaky. Is this a friend of yours? Why haven't you told me about him? Either way, these pictures are so creepy. You gotta tell me what you're going to use them for. P.S. I have a photo project planned for Halloween. Could you maybe ask him if he would be interested? Charlotte. I read the message only once. My full attention was focused on finding out what was on those pictures. Nothing else mattered. And yet, I felt hesitation and anxiety grow as I clicked through the pictures, one by one. Gradually, a skinny and pale figure emerged from the shadows. It looked like a male dressed in a pair of dark trousers, maybe denim or something. In the first three pictures, he was moving away, further into the wilderness. However, once I laid eyes on the last photo, I practically screamed out in horror. Although the quality was grainy and in low resolution, I could still make out that awful face, empty eyes reflecting the flash of the camera, a demented, feral smile, frozen in an animalistic snarl. It was a man, but one driven by the primal instinct to murder. The third and final thing my brain will never be able to blank out, and what made me realize how close to death I've been that night, was the wood-cutting axe resting in his right hand. Well, my friends, we've reached the end of tonight's chilling tale, The Night My Grandfather Returned, by the talented You Swedish Creep. I hope you've enjoyed our descent into darkness, and that you'll carry a piece of the Fear File Chronicles with you as you drift into uneasy dreams. If our story left you shivering and shaking, don't forget to like this video, share it with others who crave a good scare, and subscribe to the Fear File Chronicles for more haunting horrors. Remember to hit the bell notification, so you're always among the first to know when a new nightmare awaits. As always, we appreciate your support and would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Sharing your fears and frights with us truly means a lot, so don't be shy to engage with our sinister community. Until next time, remember to embrace the darkness, 
for it is within the shadows that our most terrifying stories are born. Good night and stay scared.